Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to you uh, here into our magnificent uh, chapel. My name is Shidesh Kapoor. I am the president and principal of King's College London. Now, many of you would know that King's motto is Sancte et Sapiente, which is holiness and wisdom. So it is wonderful that we are gathered here in a chapel, which is a monument to holiness, to celebrate the dawn of 3D, which in many ways is a marvel of applied wisdom. So we will talk of both of these today. Now, the history of this chapel interconnects with the life of the person we are here to celebrate, Sir Charles Wheatstone, who was our first professor of experimental philosophy. That's what physics used to be called in those days. Now, it's a truly stunning location to marvel. Um, I don't know if those who are live streaming can see it, but if you look around, it's a marvelous 3D chapel here. And now Charles Wheatstone would not have seen this because in his days, King's was young and this was a rather meager chapel. And it is said that in uh, 1859, which is actually around this time and a bit after, uh, it was thought to, thought to be remarkable for its meagerness and poverty for a college that was of King's distinction. Well, things have changed. One might say it's the other way around now, and it is the other way around, thanks to someone uh, we know rather all well, that's Sir George Gilbert Scott, because uh, he was a contemporary of Wheatstone, and he was invited to lead the redesign of this chapel, and it is very close today to what he finished then. Um, it might surprise you that its first such incarnation cost 7,000 pounds. Good days those were, I have to say, as a college president. You could get a lot done in 7,000 those days. But let me now turn to Wheatstone, who was there at the time. He was a prolific scientist, an irrepressible inventor, and a great public communicator of science. Now, we will talk about his work in optics, but we cannot let go of his work in telegraphy because he was one of the pioneers of the telegraph. And not only was the pioneer of inventing the telegraph, he was the one who got it applied very first. And the place of application was, of course, the railways. Now, the railways didn't naturally get the value of that invention. It had to be demonstrated to them what it could do for the railways. And one of the things Charles Wheatstone did, he was very good at demonstrations. And the one demonstration that he did in the 1840s is at the terrace of Somerset House. Now, by the way, in those days, the embankment wasn't running. The embankment wasn't even there. So he got a lot of royalty on the terrace of Somerset House, installed one end of his telegraph apparatus there, and installed a cannon on the other side of the Waterloo Bridge. And what he was demonstrating was that you press a button here, and a cannon goes off. Now, to all of us who've lived in a world of electricity and wires, I mean, this, like, you know, it's a nursery school demonstration. But you can imagine that in those days, for people to see that a non-mechanical transmission, no pulleys, no gears, just a little wire that goes all the way across the Thames and a cannon goes off would be truly spectacular. Sadly, on the day of the demonstration, the cannon didn't go off. But they say he was such a good demonstrator that most of the people came away impressed at the power of telegraphy, even though nothing happened. But look, the man has done a lot. Uh, his best known contribution to optics are his works on stereoscopy. Uh, it's based on the work of Euclid, who was the father of geometry, who understood that each eye sees a slightly different view. Now, Wheatstone realized that the brain makes use of these subtle differences to determine perspective. And consequently, his stereoscope provided a 3D, a three-dimensional image by combining the two pictures set in a slightly dissimilar perspective. He was the first person to show an understanding of the visual intricacies of spatial perception, and it is his principles which brought to life the invention of the stereoscope. Did I say he was a professor of philosophy? He was indeed, but you can see there was physics and physiology in that. I think was, he was the professor of everything PH, and he did that very well. Now, so significant were his discoveries uh, that all the work that has followed ever since on optical perception has been based on his principles. And his work has influenced diverse fields, 
from things that we use today, like cutting-edge medical scanning technologies that we see in our hospitals. Next time you go have a CT or a PET scan, some fundamental principles being used were the principles that he discerned. And, of course, increasing line to the development of virtual and augmented reality. So it is this depth of discovery that we are here to celebrate, and not just to celebrate, but to experience as we gather to mark the launch of Stereoscopy, the Dawn of 3D which explores some of the highlights of Wheatstone's extraordinary scientific, artistic, and social breakthroughs. Written by the photographic historian, Dennis Pellerin, alongside Dr. Brian May, they have dived into the King's archives. No mean feat, that is, as these historic records extend to six kilometers worth of material which spans the history of science, medicine, literature. I don't know how six kilometers was measured or how it was Imagine, but wonderful, six kilometers of data, and uh, all of that to publish this fascinating account of stereoscopy. So thank you all for joining us today, those who could be with us here in the chapel and those who are with us virtually. It is an honor to be able to celebrate a luminary from King's rich history with you while marking the launch of this exploration of 3D, 3D innovation. So thank you. And let me now welcome our Dean of King's College London, the Reverend Dr. Ellen Clark King. Ellen. Let me add my own welcome to you all to our beautiful chapel and to those joining us online hosted by the British Library and the London Stereoscopic Company. And it's especially a total delight to welcome you, Dr. May, back to this special space. Professor Kapoor has spoken about the physical history of the chapel, so let me just say a very few words about its spiritual significance within the life of King's. King's was originally an Anglican foundation, a place where education has always had a purpose beyond itself, as Professor Kapoor said in our motto of holiness and wisdom words that we might nowadays live out as a, a passion for justice and inclusion, for positive change in the world, and for spiritual maturity and depth in all our students. Faith doesn't stand in the place of, or in the way of, scientific curiosity and questioning. At its best, faith calls us to look at our universe with eyes wide open to its wonder and deep curiosity as to its workings. Which is why this is the perfect space to learn more about the discoveries, insights, and the wonderful stereoscopic vision of Charles Wheatstone. The theologian Irenaeus told us that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. I cannot imagine a better way of being fully alive than combining creativity and music alongside intellectual rigor and discovery. So please enjoy this evening as we listen and learn from Dr. May, someone who most definitely embodies all of those. And now let me hand over to Professor Wilder, who is our host for this evening. Thank you very much for those two wonderful introductions to the space and the event. Before we begin, I need to give some instructions to the people who are joining us online. Welcome everyone who's joining us far away from here, near or far. Um, I just want to say that you can submit questions to us even while we're beginning the introductions. If you look at the form below your video window, you'll be able to type in your questions for us and we'll be able to take them on later on in the conversation. You can submit them anytime during the conversation. During these introductions, uh, we'll, we'll keep taking questions right up until the end. If you would like, by chance, to buy a copy of Stereoscopy, The Dawn of 3D, um, during the event, you can press the Books tab at the top of the screen. So send us your questions. And now I will begin by, I have a great, the great pleasure of being able to introduce Dr. Brian May. Um, among his many other talents, 
Dr. May is an accomplished stereo photographer, inventor, collector, and head of the prolific and fantastic London Stereoscopic Company. His collaborative publications, From a Village Lost and Frowned, T.R. Williams, um, Through the Diableries, <laughs> um, to the republication of George Washington Wilson's fantastic and prolific um, stereoscopic works. These have pushed the field of, stereo of stereoscopy studies to reconsider these humble photographs as serious areas of photographic history and photographic history study. In particular, his invention of the owl viewer and his insistence on publishing books in which the stereos are reproduced full size so that they can be used with the owl viewer has introduced a whole generation of scholars um, and enthusiasts to looking at stereos in the viewers in 3D as they really should be seen. It's made a huge difference to how we go to archives and view the material. Um, it's, we can now take our own viewers with us and we can see these materials, these historic materials, as they were really meant to be seen. His services to photographic history are many and varied, and I could go on for much longer, but I won't, I promise. Um, but they include this lasting legacy um, in the form of the archive of stereoscopy, which I know we will be enjoying for many years. And now, I'm gonna invite you to introduce Denis. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to address myself to those out there first, if I may. Just remind you that this is what it should look like in your house right now. You have your, um, your smartphone of whatever kind. On its side, you have your OWL VR kit, and the phone goes in here like this, and you're all set for stereoscopy. And uh, you won't see me in 3D right now, but you will see all of our items, which Denis will be showing you, and I will be showing you this one. So that's that. And I'd now like to address my audience here, if I may. We have a wildly enthusiastic audience here of stereoscopic aficionados. Are you okay? Yes. I just wanted you to hear them, to know that you're here. Um, thank you all for being here. I don't take it lightly at all that I'm speaking in this incredible place, the, the home of so much innovation and scientific thought, philosophic thought over many generations. I'm very honored to be invited to speak here. I'm only speaking in a humble role because I'm actually introducing Denis Pellerin, who is the author of our book. But um, I want to just say a couple of words to you about what stereoscopy is. Now, to some of you, I apologize because you already know, but I'm hoping we have a lot of casual visitors um, who might be saying, well, what is stereoscopy? Why does it matter? Well. Stereoscopy is all around us, but it's kind of hidden in plain sight because we're not really aware of it. We don't pay much attention to it, and we don't appreciate it. Stereoscopy, I use this word again, is what came to be known in the 1950s as 3D, three-dimensional representation. Three-dimensional meaning height, width, and depth. Why does it matter? Why would we need to do this? We're talking about representational art here, which is painting or photography uh, and a few other things. And we're trying to represent, as, as our ancestors have done since the beginning, uh, we're trying to represent things around us which we enjoy and we like to take away with us to enjoy in the comfort of our homes. Um, it goes back to, to cavemen making representations of the animals around them in their caves. And they were actually very good at it. And again, they painted on a flat surface, reasonably flat, being a cave wall, I suppose. Um, and they had width, they had height, but they did not have depth. So this was art as it was first known to human beings. Um, but actually, if you look at what happened in, in the history of representational art, nothing much changed for the next few thousand years in that sense. We, we find ourselves in the Renaissance, where Leonardo da Vinci and others discovered the miracle of perspective, and they were able to make parallel lines in real life converge to an infinity on the, on the canvas and introduce a lot more realism into what they did. Uh, if you look at the Last Supper, you can see these converging lines in the ceiling, very impressive. And if you close one eye, it kind of looks 3D. But 
What astonishes me to this day, always, is that the Renaissance did not discover stereopsis. Nobody twigged the fact that we have two eyes for a very good reason, and in, in, in evolutionary terms, it must have been an incredible advantage to us. Um, as your president has told you, um, what's happening here is your brain is being presented every second of your life with two slightly different views of the universe. And your brain, all of our brains, perform this amazing function every second of our lives of combining these two pictures with their slight little differences um, into, a, into a model of the universe which exists inside your head. And it has width and it has height and it has depth. It's a miracle. This is called stereopsis. And nobody in the Renaissance, to my knowledge, tumbled upon this fact. The man who did is Charles Wheatstone. Um, as you've heard, he was a professor here, so it's a very, very important significance to me that we're here presenting this, this book in this place where he was a professor. I feel very humbled looking at the genius of this man, but I also feel very reassured because we all, I mean, those of us who, who've learned about him respect him beyond belief, but he was known in his time, and I only know this thanks to Denis, I only know anything thanks to Denis. Um, he was known in his time as a very, very shy and embarrassed uh, communicator in, as, as a lecturer. In fact, he was so bad that ma mainly they didn't ask him to, to do the lectures. And um, there is one story where he was invited to give a presentation at the, um, um, the, um, the Royal Institution just up the road here. And he got so nervous that he disappeared. He ran out of the building because he was too nervous to give his presentation. Chased by Faraday, <laughs> apparently, who brought him back, hauled him back in. And uh, Faraday eventually apparently gave the lecture that particular time. And henceforth, if people were uh, invited to speak at the institution, they would lock the doors so they wouldn't run away at the last minute and, and do, a, do a wheat stone apparently, as they used to say. I love that story. So I, I always get nervous at these things. I feel nervous right now because it's always a one-off. It doesn't ever get easier. But I'm thrilled to be doing it. Okay, I'm going to move on. Wheatstone's genius was to realize that this sensation that happens to us all the time, this, this stereopsis thing, could be reproduced. It could be reproduced by putting two dissimilar pictures in some kind of apparatus so that our eyes were presented with these two different pictures, just like in real life. And then the miracle would happen again. Um, so this is the birth of the knowledge of humanity, uh, the consciousness that 3D exists and it's worth reproducing. So now instead of painting on our walls or painting on a canvas, we can paint in 3D and we get a much, much more faithful um, rendition of the scene that we're trying to reproduce. Why is that important? Is it just entertaining? Is it just fun? Well, it is fun. I mean, we're all very familiar, I think, with uh, James Cameron's mastery of the art of 3D and uh, producing the film Avatar, which really gave birth to a new awareness of what 3D is, and suddenly every TV was 3D ready. Funny thing is, they're not anymore, are they? This reflects a strange phenomenon which associates itself with uh, stereoscopy, that it comes, everyone gets incredibly enthusiastic, and then it kind of dies out, because maybe it's too much trouble. I don't know if, if I can really answer why. Um, but um, yes, it is entertaining, and, and we like our 3D films, I think, but it's much more than that. Again, as your, your president has told you, um, well, I can tell you, I had a heart attack uh, <clears throat> about a year ago, and the man who put three stents in my arteries surrounding the heart routinely performs that operation on patients in Australia while he's here, in his lab here. And it's done, he wears a virtual reality mask and he has tools which are represented in Australia and he can do that incredibly fine operation by using virtual reality. Virtual reality is the great grandson of 3D. It's the same thing. The only thing that's added is this very neat little trick where the, the, uh, the, the objects that you're looking at will stay still while you move your head. But it's, it's basically what Charles Wheatstone invented, in, or discovered and invented in 1832. Um, so it's, it has some very serious uses. There are other uses. At present, there are a lot of 
space ex explorations going on um, into our solar system. There are people, uh, particularly NASA and ESA and JAXA, which is the Japanese version of NASA, they are sending probes to visit all the other objects in the solar system apart from the Earth. So comets, meteors, moons, planets, even Pluto. And of course they're unmanned. So there's no man in there or woman um, or being of any kind who can actually witness what these probes are seeing. So how do we see it? Well, the photographs get telemetered back. And I'm very fortunate to be working with a lot of these people to, uh, to seize the opportunity to make stereoscopic views from the photography that's sent back. So you can then sit in your, in your home looking at your computer and you can imagine that you were there next to, say, a comet or an asteroid and you have eyes 100 million miles apart and you're able to see this object in 3D. Now, this is the only slide I'm going to show you. Um, <laughs> so if you've got your 3D... Uh, equipment ready at home, here we are. Oh, I'm not seeing that in 3D here, let me see, okay. I'm hoping that you can see this, but I'm cheating a little bit, because what you can see at the moment, I think, is, is mono. This is what would happen if there was no 3D in the world. And this is the asteroid called Bennu. It's been visited by an amazing NASA mission called OSIRIS-REx. They loitered around next to this object, which is about half a mile across, uh, for a number of months, took lots of wonderful pictures, and this is an example of um, the kind of thing which uh, these missions are sending back. Th things which have never been seen in human existence until now. So now I'm gonna cheat, this is the mono version, and can you guess what kind of shape this object is? Maybe it's something, it's a sort of flat biscuit thing with, with rounded corners maybe. No, if you see it in 3D, It looks very different, right? And you can see the shape is like a, well, it's like a spinning top. And this thing is rotating. Um, we're, we're sitting on the equator here. And a lot of these asteroid objects look like this. They're kind of rubble piles. They're not very solid. And the spinning motion generates uh, this, this spinning top shape. And if you look, if you keep looking, you see more and more. You can see so much of the detail on the Terminator between the light and the dark side. These objects, this particularly large object near the bottom is called Ben Ben. And um, you can see it in, in glorious 3D. If it was flat, you wouldn't really register, I think. But the 3D gives you so much more. So it's not just a toy and it's not just entertainment. This gives an instinctive understanding of so many objects um, before the science even starts. Um, okay, that's my only slide. I'm going to leave it up there in case you like it. But um, no, we should take it down. Um, I'm here to introduce Denis Pellerin. And Denis Pellerin and myself, if you look at us, you see two men who have had a very similar dream for most of their lives. Two men who uh, wanted to bring a full awareness of Victorian stereoscopy into the 21st century. Um, getting to know each other over the last 10 years, we've made great strides. And um, actually, a lot of the dreams have come true. I guess we, uh, we fit together in, in a complementary fashion. We've both been interested in 3D all our lives. I had the passion of collecting 1850s stereoscopic cars for the last 50 years at least. Denis has had the passion of investigating the origins of these stereo cards. Um, Denis has the tenacity to actually live in the 19th century. He very seldom comes out, so you're, very, you're witnessing something quite rare here. He lives in the 19th century. I guess I live about halfway between the 19th and the 21st century. But he has the talent for living in this, this situation, researching it in incredible depth, and of being able to write it up in a coherent fashion. I've become an editor, uh, kind of by default, because of the London Stereoscopic Company, as it is now. And I've enjoyed so much collaborating with Denis to make this book. And the London Stereoscopic Company, as it is now recreated, is the channel through which we can promulgate, we can share this, all from, this, all, this, um, this wonderful information um, with the world. So the London Stereoscopic Company, I'm stuttering now, the London Stereoscopic Company is very proud to, um, to um, publish this work written by Denis. And... Um, of all the books we've published, perhaps this is the one that I most dreamed of putting out there, because it is the very core 
of stereoscopic uh, research. It's where it all started. And um, this is the book which I wanted to write and couldn't write. It's been written by Denis, thanks to his, uh, his great works and his great research. Um, it's the very birth of stereoscopy, and to be honest with you, this story has never been told before in the way that it's told in this book. There have been so many misconceptions and so many deliberate misrepresentations, as you will find if you read the book, and I know Denis will refer to this. So this is the first time the true story has been told. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the author of our book, Stereoscopy, the Dawn of 3D. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Denis Bellerin. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And we're going, we're going to leave space and uh, get back in time for, for um, a while. So this is um, King's College as it was in the past. Sorry, well, we could only get uh, flat pictures, uh, which Stone or nobody else actually um, thought of um, taking stereos of King's College, but you, you can see that uh, if you know the building, things, some things haven't changed really. Uh, the building's not very old. King's College was open in uh, the early 1830s anyway, so not very old building, but uh, there have been some improvements. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really proud that we can, we can uh, do this uh, presentation here because it's the home of stereoscopy. And uh, I'm very grateful to the principal of the college and to the, to the whole team, to the British Library, of course, who is uh, stream, uh, stream, uh, streaming this event, this talk. And uh, we are going here, also, we're here as well to celebrate the archive, the wonderful wor wor work of the people, the team at the archives under the direction of uh, Jeffrey Browell. And uh, we, we've worked here for quite a long time. I'm sorry. And uh, we're here as well to celebrate this man. So this man, this is Charles Whitstone. This is a late portrait by the London Stereoscopic Company, which was never actually meant to be, uh, to be uh, published in 3D, but we managed to find a negative. And here he is uh, towards the end of his life, uh, short, about four, four or five years before his death, really. Here. And I'm so, so glad because when I was researching for that book, I, tr I was trying to find a statue or a bust of Whitstone, and th that's the only one we found. We found a bust in the basement of um, the Science Museum. It, it was part of the Whitstone collection, and it was down in the basement. And he was in good company because Prince Albert was there, and Queen Victoria, and some other people, Andrew Ross, and uh, uh, other people. But it's the only bust, the marble bust of Whitstone in existence. There are no statues of Whitstone. He is really a sort of a forgotten genius. And uh, I hope, or we hope, this book is going to put him back in the limelight. So we are here as well to celebrate this book, the dawn of 3D, stereoscopy, the dawn of 3D. And we're going to examine how it all happened. So it's not the first time uh, Dr. May and myself have come to King's College. We were here. Uh, in 2016, we gave a talk about uh, Charles Whitstone, actually. And uh, I was back again in 2018. And again, when we managed to get this um, box back to King's College, it was on loan at uh, the Science Museum. And this is how it all started. And why did we bring it back here? Because I had this picture in mind. The, the stereoscope was at the Science Museum. And it was going away to Swindon because the storage rooms at Blythe House were being vacated because uh, they wanted to make luxury flats. Uh, as everybody knows, that's what London needs most. And so everything was going uh, away to Swindon. And I had that picture in mind, which is the last picture of Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know that warehouse. And I was thinking, oh my God, this, if this, this disappears, we will never find it again. So thanks to Jeffrey and his team, we managed to bring the stereoscope back to King's College, and that's, I'm very proud of that, I must say. And I'm very, very grateful to uh, Jeffrey and his team for that. So, yeah. <laughs> so
So here it is. Here is the grail of stereoscopy. This is the very first stereoscope. It doesn't look like much. It looks very crude. It's a DIY, if you want. Uh, it's, but it's, it is the first stereoscope ever. And uh, well, as you can see, it's made of wooden glass, just wooden, two pieces of mirror. And, and that's it. And that's how Whitstone managed to show his uh, contemporaries how stereoscopy, how stereopsis worked. He could free view himself, but he needed an instrument to show people how it worked. And he did it with mirrors. Uh, two mirrors at an angle of uh, 90 degrees and two drawings on our panels on either side. And that's how it worked. And we were very, very uh, fortunate, Dr. May and I, to, to be able to hold it uh, this afternoon. We were wearing gloves, uh, but we managed to hold it and to, to look at it again. And this is an amazing, really, an amazing stereoscope. Amazing piece of work. A, a lot of people would not even have a second look, but for us, it is the beginning of everything. Now, when Whitstone invented the stereoscopy, there was no photography. So, to, in order to prove what he was, he was um, what his theories, he had to draw pictures, and this is one of them. We managed to find a few of the original drawings from Whitstone, the ones he presented in a, um, at the in front of the Royal Society in 1838, and this is one of them. And here is another one which was not in his presentation. It's very crude, it's not really perfect, but these are the first stereo pictures ever. These are the oldest ones. We don't know exactly if they are from 1832 or 38, but they are from the, 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 um, the 30s, the 1830s, and they are the earliest examples, surviving examples of stereoscopic pairs. Now, we found, I found this letter at uh, the Royal Society as well, and this is interesting. Uh, I intend the stereoscope, the instrument which accompanies this letter, as a present to your daughters, he is writing to a friend in Cornwall. Their skills in drawing will enable them, by following the rules contained in the paper, to produce many beautiful effects by its aid. My drawings, you will see, are confined to outline geometrical figures. So. Whitstone, when he produced his stereoscope, just sent the stereoscope. People had to make their own drawings following his instructions. So that's amazing. People, I mean, especially uh, young girls at the time, the, their education lacked in many, many respects, but they were mostly very good at sewing, cooking, and drawing. So they managed to use the stereoscope. Now, this is another very important piece in the archive, uh, and that's another one we managed to get back from the, um, the Science Museum, where it was on loan since 1924. This is a prismatic and lenticular stereoscope. Now, this is very important because according to history of photography, uh, Brewster invented the lenticular stereoscope, and this is Whitstone's prototype, and it's was made before Brewster's invention. But Whitstone, for some reason, well, Brian told us he was a very shy person, didn't want to antagonize Brewster, and he uh, sort of accepted that Brewster was the inventor of the lenticular stereoscope, but this, this proved that he was not. Whitstone was, and this, this is a double stereoscope. The, the, the board at the bottom is prisms, and the, the, the board, which is a bit, well, the flap, which is lifted, uh, lenses. So you could actually fuse the images, and with the lenses, you could magnify them. So it's a very clever prototype, uh, not in very good condition. It was actually made, made uh, into, uh, for the com commerce, it was commercialized, and this is an early example. And this, this was given to John Percy, uh, who took photos for Whitstone stereoscopes in 1885. Now, this is Sir David Brewster, the inventor of the Brewster-type stereoscope, which you can see on the table next to him. Uh, he improved, he said he improved Whitstone stereoscopes, and Whitstone actually let it go at that. Um, at the beginning, when Whitstone presented his mirror stereoscope, Brewster was very enthusiastic. He said it's, um, it's um, amazing what uh, Mr. Whitstone did, but gradually, he, he got to, to the point where he thought he had invented stereoscopy, and it got very, very bad. It got to a fight 
a fight in the columns of the Times. Okay, so this is not a real photo. I tweaked it, of course, but this is, this is exactly what happened. They exchanged very um, violent letters in the columns of the Times to, because Brewster was contesting um, Wheatstone's claim as the inventor of stereoscopy. Now, for the, the earliest photos we have for the stereoscope, unfortunately, a lot of, lots of them have disappeared, are this um, portrait of Michael Faraday, which is a daguerreotype, or two daguerreotypes for the Wheatstone stereoscope, and this picture of uh, Dr. John Adamson, which is a calotype. And this, this is a self-portrait, apparently, which uh, Brewster took to Paris when he, he was trying to uh, interest opticians in uh, making his stereoscope. And so the stereoscope is a British invention, but it went to France because Brewster fell off, fell out with uh, everybody in, in Britain, so nobody wanted to uh, make his stereoscope. So he went to Paris, he met this person, Louis-Jules Dubosc, who accepted to make the stereoscope for him, and the stereoscope was introduced back in Britain at the time of the Great Exhibition of 1851. And this is uh, an original daguerreotype from uh, Dr. May's collection showing the 1851 exhibition. And as you can see, this is the actual Crystal Palace. There is an elm tree in the middle. Actually, there were three. There were, there were two at the other end. Uh, but we never see them in photographs, strangely. So this is a very early photo. The, the first stereoscopic photographs people could actually see were photos of the Crystal Palace. Now, this is just a page, it's flat, sorry, but it's one of the most complete and most interesting article that was published on the stereoscope as early as January 1852. And it's illustrated with woodcuts, obviously, no photographs at the time, and uh, it shows lots of stereoscopic pairs, but nobody had a stereoscope at the time, so the irony of it is that it tells you all about stereoscopy, but the photos, well, the, the drawings, you have to squint to see them. You can look at them without a stereoscope because nobody had a stereoscope at the time. So that's the irony of it, and it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful article, and you've got, you, you've got, you can see two examples of stereoscope, the Wheatstone stereoscope at the top with the mirrors, and the Brewster stereoscope at the bottom, well, in the middle, really. At the beginning, it was very expensive to buy photographs, daguerreotypes, photographs on metal. So people used the stereoscope with uh, outlined figures like this one. Uh, th these were lithographs, so they were not very expensive. And there were lots of them published. These are uh, by Jules Dubos. They were published uh, in the late 1850s in France. And the following ones are by uh, Frederick Hale Holmes, who was uh, an engineer in Britain, and he published two sets of these stereolithographs in, um, in 1852. So these are the first commercial uh, images that were bought by people. Most of the images were actually mirror images. So you drew one image and then you drew the mirror of that image and when you put it in the stereoscope, you actually had depth. Of course, they started take, taking portraits in studio daguerreotypes, daguerreotype portraits uh, had been made since uh, since 1839-40, uh, so they started taking stereoscopic daguerreotypes of people of still lives, like here, the Medici, Medici vase. It's a replica, but it's uh, still a very nice uh, stereo. And still lives, and this one is particularly interesting. It's also from Dr. May's collection, like nearly all of those pictures. And it shows, because it shows a Brewster stereoscope on the, on the left, and underneath a Wheatstone stereoscope, and it's, it's the only photo we found of a Wheatstone stereoscope so far. And there are some other stereoscopes as well in the image. Uh, this is another interesting one. This is a photo by Claudet. Uh, Antoine Claudet was a French photographer but working in Britain. And again, it shows lots of uh, photographic equipment, including, including on, the, on the left, the Wheatstone stereoscope, prismatic stereoscope, and on the right, the Bruce, Brewster type stereoscope. So we know the Wheatstone prismatic stereoscope was commercialized as well. And at the bottom, you, you have a box with a lithograph, stereoscopic lithograph. So that's an amazing image, and it's in the book. Now, some people were working, uh, to taking photos for a Wheatstone's uh, mirror stereoscope, and one of them was Roger Fenton. This is a photo of the Isle of Wight by Roger Fenton, 
also in 1852. And I chose this photo of uh, Paris, uh, Notre Dame, without the spire, uh, and when the morgue was about to be demolished uh, from about the same time, around 1852. And these are in the collection here, in the Whitstone collection at uh, King's College uh, London and in the archives. Uh, they have the largest collection of stereoscopic pairs for the uh, Whitstone stereoscope, about 96 pairs, and they are so incredibly difficult to find that it's a, really, a real treasure to have them here. Now, the Victorians, they, nothing was impossible for them, and this is a very nice example as well. This is another thing we brought back from the Science Museum, and it's here now. It is a panoramic stereoscope invented by Jules Dubosc. So, you, you would look through the oculars here, and if you see the back of the, the, back of the stereoscope here, you've got two, two boards, one above the other. The, the picture, unfortunately, is faded, but we managed to find the original slide from which the photos were made. And this is it. This is the original glass slide, and it's an over-under stereoscopy stereoscopic photograph. I mean, over under is what most DVD Blu-rays, uh, 3D Blu-rays use, the technique they use. Jules Dubosc in 1852 had already invented the technique. He was using mirrors, one pointed upwards, one pointed downwards, and you could see in stereo. And this is what you could actually, you could actually watch. So this is a panorama, 3D panorama, 1852, Paris. Uh, by Jules Dubosc, and this is amazing. They were already trying to find, to, to create some sort of movement in the stereoscope. One year after stereoscopy was introduced during the Great Exhibition for the, the well, I mean, commercial stereoscopy, I would say. So this is a panorama of Paris in 1852, and that's really amazing. Now, also in 1852, in, in, the, in May, in the, the journal La Lumière, there was an article about Whitstone and Claudet working on movement, movement in the stereoscope. And they were working separately. Uh, Claudet was working with two images showing the, the extreme phases of movement, and Whitstone was working with the phenokistiscope, you know, this wheel with uh, things which were drawn on it, and when you sp spun the wheel, in a mirror, you could see movement. And they were, they were not uh, aware of each other's uh, research, but this is what happened. So this is Claudet. This is a, a daguerreotype of Claudet. So you can see that it's in 3D, uh, but there is something wrong with the hand. Now, why? Because you had to close one eye and then the other to see the movement. And this is what it looks like. So this is 1852, and this is the beginning of the cinema in a way. Not very, okay, you, 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 you can't see much, and there is not much of a story, but this is the beginning. They were trying to apply 3D and movement one year after they started uh, stereoscopy as a, as a business in a way. And this is a very, very rare um, uh, advertisement showing the bioscope, the, the, the one bottom, bottom left. It's a, it is a sort of phenakistiscope, but with photographs. So animated photographs in 3D. Ooh. And this is the original uh, disc, the only surviving discs for all we know. And as you can see, it's very faded. And it shows a steam engine. And when you spin the disc and you look at it with a special stereoscope, unfortunately the bioscope has disappeared totally. We don't, we don't know, uh, we've never found any uh, surviving uh, sample of it. But when you, when you look at it in 3D, in the stereoscope, this is what you see. You see movement in 3D. And we are in 1852. Now, this is in the book, but we couldn't see the film, of course. We couldn't show the film in the book, so it had to be shown uh, for you here. So, gradually, the photographers got out of the studio. And you have to remember that in those days, when you wanted to take a photo, uh, somebody mentioned the uh, wet collagen plate. You had to prepare your uh, uh, well, plate before you took the photo. You had to coat the plate with collagen, you had to sensitize it 
expose it to the light in the camera, develop it at once, and then varnish it, and then you could start another one. And they did stereos, two pictures, everywhere, and they started exploring the world. So they needed a dark room, they needed water, and this, this uh, sorry, the next photo, yeah, the next photo shows um, the dark room tent of Francis Frith, who went to Egypt in 1857 and later on as well, and started taking stereo photographs of Egypt. And so the, you can see his tent at the, at the bottom, and you can imagine a black, well, black tent, uh, very thick, so that there was no light going through, in the desert, well, in the, under the Egyptian sun. And he, Frith, in his me memoir, says that the, the, the collodion was mixing with the sweat from his face. And the collodion was actually boiling on the plate. And he still managed to take those images in, amazing images. If you wanted to take photos on a glacier, you had to take your dark room and your water and all your chemicals on the glacier as well and pitch your tent on the glacier. If you wanted to take photos in London, you couldn't pitch a tent. You had to have a portable dark room. And if you wanted, if you were traveling and taking photos through uh, Brittany, like here, or Normandy, or Italy, you could also have a sort of a dark room, a van, a dark room van, which, uh, which you could uh, take anywhere. And it was a van. You lived there. It was a caravan and a dark room at the same time. So that's what they did in the 1850s. And by the end of the 1850s, you could visit the whole world in 3D. And they, sorry, they started making lots and lots of uh, stereos. They were manufacturing, there were factories of stereos, and this is a very rare uh, example of showing the making of stereo photographs. And gradually, stereos came into the parlor of the middle classes, and this is a photo showing uh, Alexis Godin, his wife, and his uh, mother-in-law, and two other people actually looking at stereos in the parlor. And that's, that was the TV of the time. Uh, Dr. May mentioned that it was the television of the 1850s. You had stereos everywhere in every parlor of the middle class. It was quite expensive, but so only for the middle class. And they could discover the world. They could get to a, they could get to a, I'm sorry, I'm going in the wrong way. They could get to a Simbel, for example, as they had never seen it before. Very few people had been to Egypt. Very few people could afford uh, the trip, and very few people uh, wanted, actually, to suffer the heat and everything. So watching the world from, uh, from home, from the fireside, in a stereoscope was a very nice option. And that's when the craze for stereoscopy started uh, in uh, around 1857, because uh, thanks to the progress in the making of uh, photographic paper, uh, cards became cheaper. And by 1859, you could even visit Japan and China. I mean, how many people in those days ever went to Japan and China? And you could also met your, well, the celebrities of the time. This is Charles uh, Dickens, taken uh, minutes before he, he was um, going to read one of his Christmas stories. This is a photo by Herbert Watkins. So we have photos of celebrities in 3D. This is, of course, uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel uh, standing in front of the Great Eastern. It, this is one of the few stereos of Brunel. And of course, this is Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria in 1854, daguerreotype hand-tinted by uh, Antoine Claudet. And Throughout her reign, we have photos of her. This is a photo by Valentine, taken in Scotland after the death of her husband. And uh, the young girl next to her is the youngest child, Princess Beatrice. And here she is again, this time in 1897. She was celebrating her sixth, the 60th anniversary of her, of her, of her reign. And uh, she was still there. And stereoscopy shows her through all the, these years. And of course, you could have nice portrait. This is a wonderful hand-tinted daguerreotype of a child by uh, Dr. May's favorite photographer, Thomas Richard Williams. And this is another interesting portrait of Colonel Hewitt, also by the same uh, photographer. And notice the tinting. I mean, tinting an image which is about uh, seven centimeters high uh, by six centimeters wide is, is, is a difficult, but you have to tint two and to make sure that it's still stereoscopic. 
very, very difficult. Nobody could do that. And of course, you could uh, escape to the land of the fairies. Or, sorry, or some fairy tales like a uh, little red riding hood. And all these photos are hand tinted again. These, these are on paper. You could also explore the supernatural with a ghost. Uh, the making of uh, stereos of ghosts was a very popular thing in the 1850s, well, 57, 58, and this is from that period. You could also have photos showing the fashion of the time here, a nice lady in crinoline and a gentleman with a, the top hat saying hello to the lady. And you could also see occupations, a wonderful photo by Frank M. Good of uh, deep sea divers. Actually, it's Dr. May sitting and I am the one without the helmet. We are di diving deep into the sea of stereoscopy. Uh, sculpture, of course, was amazing in the stereoscope, especially when you use the mirrors because you could see both sides of the sculpture. And to this day, I don't understand why sculptures are not all photographed in stereo. I still don't understand why photograph a sculpture with just one image, flat. Uh, you could recreate paintings. This is the death of Chatterton by, uh, after uh, Henry Wallace, a very famous painting from 1856. And you could also take photos of the moon. So we're going to ask, uh, well, doctor may explain a little, or he's going to explain uh, during the talk how you can take a photo of the moon uh, when you are standing on Earth. And uh, some uh, social issues were also approached in the stereoscope. This one is called Out in the Bitter Cold, and it's the fate of these widows. Uh, they had 40 days to uh, leave the premises after the death of their husbands. And uh, if they were not rich, if they didn't have any wealthy relatives, they ended up in the streets with their children. And the special effects as well, rain. I mean, remember, uh, exposures were about 20 seconds, so you can't photograph rain, you can't photograph um, dresses or skirts being blown by the wind, so you have to imagine special effects for the stereoscope. So strings for the rain and wires, of course, holding the dresses, but it's, it's still special effect, the, the very beginning. And all this with the London Stereoscopic Company, the, the original one, which was created in 1854, and it was part of it, and millions of stereos were sold by the London Stereoscopic Company in Britain and by other firms in, in France, for example, for example, the Godin Brothers in Paris. And it's only fitting that uh, we should actually write, uh, the new London Stereoscopic Company, write a book about, about uh, stereoscopy. And I will end here. This is uh, the... The, the, the sort of uh, the end of that, in a way, it's uh, our sort of uh, a way to say thank you to our predecessors, the wonderful things they did, and we wanted to, to pay tribute to them in that book and to pay tribute to Charles Wheatstone and stereoscopy. Thank you very much. very much. I want to remind those of, of you who are out in the ether, you're not really in ether, but to us you are, that we're very happy to take your questions. If you want to type them in, you'll see the questions um, uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Please send us in some questions and we'll take those in a few moments. We can also take questions from our live audience eventually, but as moderator, I get, I get to ask the first bunch of questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Denis. That was a fabulous introduction to the book. There's so much more in it. And some of it, I think, it would be really good for the audience to know those people who don't know the stereo industry from the 1850s and especially the 1860s. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the size of the industry? Once it left these few individuals doing really groundbreaking work, it became an enormous thing. Do you want to talk a little bit about that huge thing that was the industry, both of you, either of you? Yeah, well, to me, there's a kind of analogy, because I'm in the music business, and, uh, you know, the music industry at its best is entertaining people with a succession of new ideas, 
and everybody's waiting for the next record from whoever it might be. It might be Madonna, I don't know, it might be um, Lady Gaga, or it might be Queen. Um, in those days, they were all absolutely psyched up and waiting for the next release from Elliot or from mm -hmm. Sylvester, you know, and they would rush out and get them and obviously take them home and enjoy this lovely private experience of looking into the box and being in the world that was created by these people. Um, it was, a, it was massive. The London Stereoscopic Company had three outlets in London alone, and they boasted a million views. So you had a wide choice of stuff, and it was massive. Landscapes, portraits, mm -hmm. items of historical interest, recreations of historical scenes, like the signing of the Magna Carta or whatever. Um, all kinds of things. Everything that you could imagine was done in, in stereoscopy in those days. I'm saying stereoscopy like Dany now. I think most people say stereoscopy, but it's a, it's a kind of ugly word. <laughs> so it's stereoscopy, yeah. What would you say, Dany? Yeah, yeah, I think, it's, well, it's actually difficult to know how many cars were produced and by whom most of the time, because there are no figures. You can't find any information in the press of the time, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, all the ledgers, all the archives of these, these companies have unfortunately disappeared. So we're only left with the cards. So we know, for example, um, uh, Brian was mentioning Elliot. Elliot. James Elliot was a very, very good photographer of genre scenes, especially. So we know he produced thousands of them because they are very common to find even these days. But so, some productions are there are only a, a handful left, so we don't know. And and it's uh, it's what's actually interesting because we don't know everything, and there's still there's still so much to uh, to research. Well, that's what I like. <laughs> yeah. Of course. And there's all these great things to find away in the archives that people haven't yet seen. Do you have a sense for um, maybe why that is, that things are still hidden at the backs of the archives in, in terms of stereoscopy? Because um, there, there is so much to say about it, and it's such a large part of history. And yet, as you said, somewhat hidden. The detrius is all in the corners of the archives still. It's curious, yes. Obviously, a lot of them have been in people's attics over the years. And generally, they were very carefully preserved as family kind of heirlooms, I suppose. So you can still find things which nobody's been looking at for 100 years. Still happens. And um, as Denise says, it's incredible to us that we've been engaged in looking at this stuff for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And we still find things which we have never come across before, outrageously beautiful and in innovative bits of stereoscopy, which were obviously big at the time, but have got lost, as you say, over the years. Well, I, I think that the problem is that uh, stereo stereos, apart from stereoscopic daguerreotypes, which were, which were very expensive at the time and which uh, have been preserved as gems and heirlooms, most of the, the other photos, they were just stacked on the, on the table. I mean, a, a bit like postcards, if, if you want, you know, or Christmas card, whatever. They were just on the table with a stereoscope, and people, if people came to visit, they would, they would enjoy a, a couple of stereos. And they were never really considered very precious. And uh, that's mm -hmm. why they were neglected by a, a lot of historians, and, and they were also commercial. And that's, that's a rude word in, in the, the world of art. I mean, as if yeah. art was never commercial. <laughs> mm, very interesting. Yeah, it's a good point. Area for me, I must say. Yeah. Yeah. As an artist, you wonder, is commercialism a dirty word? I mean, the, the two extremes, are, neither of them are very good. The, the one extreme is you're in your, in, in, your, uh, in your room and you make art and you never show it to anyone, which is actually not very helpful to anyone. It's not a conversation. And the other extreme is you just make your, you convert your art into something which is just about making money, mm -hmm. which is obviously not a good extreme either. But somewhere in the middle, I believe, is where artists normally sit. They want to create from their hearts. It's a very private thing, but they want to be heard. They want to communicate. They want to get a reaction from an audience. And that's exactly where these uh, Victorian um, wonderful stereoscopic photographers sat. It was commercial, and they were vying for an audience. But it was art, and in my opinion, very innovative and very true to, uh, to their hearts. And there is something else as well. I mean, uh, flat photos you can put in a frame, you can exhibit, you, you know. But stereos, you can't. I mean, stereo on a, stereos are very small. They, they look ridiculous in a frame. And, and you can't just, you know, just go around in a, a room with stereos. You have to stop and look at them. That's the, that's the, the main difference. And it, it uh, needs an effort 
And a lot of people are not ready these, well, these days, and some were not maybe in the past, to, to, to make that effort. Hmm. There are also, I think, the contribution of having um, a stereo viewer hmm. that you can take with you as a researcher hmm. into an archive where um, the technology has been split apart from the images makes a big difference. Because very often the technology is over in one collection, and the images are in a different collection. And in order to view these, you need both. And very often those collections have been um, separated artificially. But now that we can all carry our own with us, thanks to you, we can take them, take them into the archive and view those images without having to merge to archives. Yeah, you don't have to explain it if you can actually see it. This brings me great joy. This is part of my dream that everyone should be able to have. <laughs> well, I'm glad it brings people joy. You know, joy. Part, of, part of the fact that uh, stereos have been neglected was that, some t that most of the time they didn't come with a stereoscope. Yeah. And in some archives, I, I won't say which one, uh, at some point in the 1930s, a curator took the stereos out of uh, the, the cupboards and he decided to keep one half for the archive and one half for the public. So he chopped all of the stereos in the collection in two halves. Mm -hmm because he didn't have a stereoscope to, to look at them and see that the, the pictures were not identical. They were slightly different and, and they were in 3D. Yeah. This is a kind of a battle which we still fight. There is great prejudice, really, against the stereoscopic photograph. And they're very much, and photography has been viewed as the poor man's art from uh, painting circles. And likewise, the, the stereoscope has been viewed as the poor man's kind of photography by photographers. Mm. So we're overcoming this kind of prejudice the whole time. And people obviously, uh, very often just don't get it because they haven't experienced it. There's a very good friend here, and I won't embarrass her by saying her name, but she got her doctorate um, by incredible persistence because her supervisor actually didn't really believe that stereoscopy was important and didn't understand why she thought it was important. Nevertheless, she persisted, and she got her doctorate, I'm thrilled to say. Um, and to me, that, that sums it all up. It's very hard. You know, we still find that people think this is a toy. And um, I guess it's our mission in life to de demonstrate that it's, not, that it's much more than that. And this is the way photography should be done, in my opinion. Maybe we need one more link to make it a bit easier for people. But this is a dream come true for me, because this is the book I always wanted to see done. And thanks to Denis, Thank we have it. To you. This explains everything. <laughs> Can I ask, speaking of dreams, come, unless you wanted to talk about it. Uh -huh. okay. um, to go back to dreams come true, I want to go back to our main characters, main character Wheatstone. But especially to, um, in this book, you bring out this relationship between Wheatstone and another fantastic favorite of photographic history, Antoine Claudet. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about their relationship and the things that they did together? Because I think Claudet is one of those fantastic characters in photographic history who is also a bit of a mystery. Um, he is, and, yeah. and maybe you want to talk about why he's a bit of a mystery, um, but also why it's important that the two of them were inventing together. Do you want to start by now? No, okay. you right. start. Well, Antoine <laughs> Claudet, as you, as you know from the name, was French. Uh, he, he actually started working uh, in glass, in a glass factory be, uh, first, and then he, he, he got interested in, in stereo, uh, well, photography, and he, he was uh, one of the pupils of Daguerre, the inventor of the, stereo, the daguerreotype and he opened one of the first photographic studios in, in, uh, in uh, London. And when the stereoscope was introduced uh, in Britain during the, the Great Exhibition, he, was, he, he didn't really see it there because it was nearly invisible. Nobody could actually see the stereoscope at the Great Exhibition. It was just a very small object among uh, 100,000 exhibits. But mm -hmm. he, he went to a soiree uh, uh, t uh, d given by Lord Ross, and, he, and he, he actually saw a stereoscope, and he started, he was one of the first to actually advertise and make stereoscopic pictures uh, of the Crystal, well, the Crystal Palace, the exhibition, and he sent some to the, the, the Tsar in Russia, and the Tsar couldn't come to the exhibition, but he was so thrilled when he saw the pictures. He said, it's, it's, uh, it's as if I had been there, and he sent Claudia a wonderful uh, a diamond ring to uh, thank him for the, for the experience. And, and Claude is, is, is a bit of a mystery because actually there is too much information about him. He advertised so much. I mean, so, some people like T.R. Williams, for example, they advertised three times in their career. Claude advertised nearly every day and he changed the advertisements nearly every week. So <laughs> we have too much information and he, he was so prolific. 
and he, he helped uh, Whitstone with a, at the beginning taking photos. Uh, he used different baselines to see uh, the exaggeration, uh, too much depth or too little depth, what was the, the, the balance between the two. So they, they worked together, but unfortunately, uh, all this early material has disappeared. And th that's terrible. That's the curse of stereoscopy. All the early images have disappeared. In part, that's because Claude's studio burned down just right. after his death when they mm -hmm. gathered everything together to divide it up among uh, the family. That was when the fire happened. So we don't know what's disappeared, sadly, mm -hmm. um, in Claude's fire. Um, so let's add in the other mix to the character, the other character to the mix, Brewster. Brewster. <laughs> we all know how cranky Brewster was, um, and he has a reputation in the history of science and in photographic history. Do you want to talk a little bit more about Brewster? <laughs> <laughs> no. we, we've tried to kind of um, tread the, the, the fine line in the book, um, <laughs> not wishing to kind of smash his reputation. You know, he had a great reputation in many fields. Mm. And he undoubtedly behaved badly towards Wheatstone, mm -hmm. because he did actually claim the discovery and tried to steal it from Wheatstone, which I think is very sad. We now know the truth, but that falsehood was perpetuated for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. you know, um, so, um, you know, fake, what do they call it? Fake news w w was in, in existence even before Donald Trump. So, um, it's, 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 it's very, I mean, <laughs> we discuss this a lot in the book, you know, do we go the whole hog? How far do we go? To, do we kind of <laughs> push Brewster too far down, no, we shouldn't, because he was a very good scientist and did some great work. And after all, he was responsible for the popularization. Mm. You can't take that away no. from him. He really was. He, he decided on this particular format, which was very portable, um, very high quality, and it could be produced relatively cheaply, and that is the reason that it completely took over Victorian Britain and France and eventually the world. Mm. So you can't take too much away from Brewster, but you know, scientists are not immune from um, uh, defects in their personalities which can make them jealous, can make them, you know, I, I live in the scientific community, I know this, and, and it's not, you know, you think people get greedy for money. Well, scientists very often do get greedy for recognition. Mm. And you can see this in many, many cases, particularly in astronomy, where, where people will seize upon an idea and they won't let that idea go, and they will defend it to their death, even though they know that it's the wrong idea. Mm -hmm. um, so scientists are, are very strange people. Science is a truth, but scientists are always searching for the truth and not always giving you what you need. <laughs> the, the worst thing Brewster did was actually to invent that, uh, the, 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 what we, we knew so far as the uh, history of the stereoscope, namely that uh, Queen Victoria uh, while she was visiting the exhibition, she visited the exhibition 34 times or something like that, she stopped at the, uh, the stand of uh, Jules Dubosc, saw the stereoscopes, and was amused. And that was the, the su a success, immediate, an overnight success for the stereoscope. Well, and, and this the myth lasted for 150 years. It didn't happen. No, no, it, it didn't, didn't happen. happen. Which, uh, Brewster invented the whole story. He wrote it in, uh, in 1852 in the North British Review. He was the editor, and he wrote it in the third person. Mm -hmm. He did that, he did that. And it's, never cor it's not corroborated by uh, Queen Victoria's Journal. It's not co corroborated by Dubosc, who was supposed to have presented the Queen with a luxurious stereoscope. It's corroborated by nobody. Mm -hmm. He invented the story. And in 1856, when he published his book about the stereoscope, he, he used the same story, but this time he said, I did this, I did that. And mm. he was Mr. Optics uh, in his days. He, he, was, he was a great person. And people believed him. And people believed him for 150 years. <laughs> and it was mm. a lie. But on the other hand, I must say that he did a lot uh, to promote the stereoscope, the applications of the stereoscope, so, something which Stone was not interested in at all. Whitstone was interested in experimenting with binocular vision. Brewster saw all the applications of the stereoscope to science, to uh, history, to uh, archaeology, uh, and even to uh, the supernatural. He's the one who gave, uh, who gave the idea to create those ghosts in the stereoscope. Mm. So, so that, that's something very important he did. All his theories about the stereoscope and all the, 
the quarrel with a Wheatstone is something we should, we should really forget. <laughs> But it's interesting nonetheless, I mean, mm. um, and these kinds of things did arise at the beginnings of photography, at the beginning of stereoscopy, um, these sort of contentious, the 1850s were notoriously contentious for photography and yeah. stereoscopy. Um, and notoriously innovative, because we can say with confidence absolutely. that everything that you can do with stereo had been done by 1858. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Everything, every possible wrinkle and innovative um, idea had been incorporated. Incredible, the richness of, of their creative powers. I think the Victorians didn't know the word impossible. I mean, I mean, we, we showed you the, the film. I mean, honestly, 1852, being able to do that, it, 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 of course, it, it looks a bit crude to, to us, but in those days, with the technology they had, that was amazing, being able to recreate movement in 3D yeah. and with photographs. Yeah, and that leads me to turn to one of our questions from um, the audience. I'm just trying to see it now. Um, which was, do you, either of you know when ophthalmologists began using those kinds of 3D drawings hmm. in, in diagnosing problems with patients? Well, very early. We have some, uh, Dubosc, didn't you make some? Yes, we have, we have some, some, uh, yeah, some, uh, some by Dubosc yeah, in the 1850s, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They're still yeah. used. I had my eyes checked recently, and they still use something quite similar. Quite similar they, they put a little things. stereoscope on you, and they try different things. And the early ones were very entertaining. You have a little budgie and a cage, yeah. and if, if you do the thing right, then the budgie will go into the cage. Yeah. So it's, um, they're delightful, these things. They are, yeah, but they, they are. are of serious use to, um, to opticians. Ophthalmologist, I suppose. Ophthalmologist. Yes, yeah, so it's tra trying to see how far you can, you can actually converge. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, there are lots of images like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some people, of course, have difficulty seeing stereo, and other people, like, can both of you free view yes, them? Yes, we can. Yeah. Both of you yeah. can free view them. I know Denis can. Yeah, it becomes a lifetime habit. As a kid, <laughs> I used to line my, my bed looking at the wallpaper, and wallpaper is always repetitive. So if you relax your eyes, the pattern will move and lock in in different positions, and suddenly the wall appears like it's coming towards you. I remember being fascinated by this stuff. And I remember lying in my bed also with one eye under the covers and the other eye not, and thinking, I've got two separate images here. What, what, and it's like a ghostly image. And all these thoughts went through my head, and I think that's why I was so fascinated when I discovered these little cards in, in Weetabix packets that actually used that fact and, and made your eyes do that thing. And, uh, yeah, I, I, was kind of, I always sort of dreamed that I, I, I ought to go back there and I kind of wish that I had invented it. I, I would be like Brewster, I would be claiming that I actually did invent it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a special technique, Denis, for teaching people how to free view? It took me an hour on a train uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 learn, to learn how to do it. Well, the, the thing is to take a card which is not too big because, I mean, the, the, the bigger the card, the, 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 more, the more difficult it is to actually fuse and to really relax your eyes and, and look not at the card but through the card and look at one particular point. So it could be, for example, the, uh, uh, the steeple of a church, you know, uh, something like that. You, you, you choose one particular point in the card and you, you just try to look through the card and just, you know, just like when you are daydreaming, you, you, let, you let your, really your eyes relax and, and suddenly it fuses. Mm. Mm. And I love that moment when you suddenly fall into the image that's right. and you've blocked yeah. out everything else and it takes yeah. over all of your perception. And that's very important. That, that's the, the, the magic of stereoscopy. You actually step into the image and, and that's something, mm. it's, it's very difficult to explain unless you've actually experienced it. Yeah. Mm. But that's the magic and I mean, uh, both of us, uh, we, we, we've seen millions of images but when we see an image, each time a new image, we have the same you know, thrill. In the, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the thrill never goes. It's yeah. funny. It's, it's a nice kind of select band of people who love this stuff, but it's, it's growing and growing. I have a wonderful community of, of uh, young stereoscopists on Instagram now, and I know a lot of you are watching. It thrills me, and I follow all of them, so I switch on my, my phone and my computer in the morning, and I can spin through lots of wonderful, new, innovative stereoscopic images from this community, which oh, exists right now. I love it. So it's growing. It's, uh, it, it's the best is yet to come. It absolutely is. And maybe that's a good point to take a question um, from one of our viewers about um, current technology, digital technology. How can we make stereo with our iPhones, for instance? It's incredibly simple. <laughs> I did it today with some of the people I met here. 
you just get your, there's a little app actually, which is very nice called. Um, this is for you, Richard. I'm going to show you. It's called i3D Steroid. And I don't know if you can see this, there's a little app, but you can easily find it. And if you go to our London Stereoscopic Company website, you can see all this stuff. But you get your little app, you go into your app, and you hit the, the camera button, and you can take a picture. I can probably show you here. I'm going to take a picture of Denis. Can you get me here? <laughs> so you take a picture of Denis. Denis's not going to move. He's going to stay like this. So I can take two pictures consecutively. Here's one. Here's another. So now I've taken the two images, and this little app puts them side by side. There's a little magic button down here which aligns them, in case I didn't do it accurately enough. And then, basically, you can save your image. You, you, save, um, you save that stereoscopic image to your photos, that original resolution, resolution. It's now saving. And I can now go into my photos and find that picture. And here it will be. Here's my photo. If you turn your cat, you, phone on the side, it's all ready. You put this in your OWL VR kit, which I assume you have, and uh, all of you here. If you don't? If you, got, if you don't, you need one. And there you have Denis in the stereoscope. And I wish I could show you it in 3D, but it's perfect. He, let me see, does he look just as 3D as he looks sitting there? Let's make sure. I'm going to admit something now. I've blundered because I've saved, the, I've saved the, the reversed image and I need to save them. So that would be all right if you were you cross-eyed. Know, what I like about that technique is that, I mean, uh, phones now are much better than most uh, stereo cameras, especially digital ones. And it's actually the technique they used at the beginning because at the beginning of uh, stereo photography, it was difficult to, to find two lenses which were identical. It's very difficult, even nowadays actually, it's very difficult to make two identical lenses. So they used one camera and they took one photo and they moved the camera to the side and they took another one. But in those days it took 20, 30 seconds. Now you can do that in two seconds and see the re results immediately. And people no. still find this difficult. I'm going to check and really? see if you look 3D. <laughs> oh, look. Actually, you look more 3D than you do in you person. You see? You see? That's the magic of 3D. That's the magic, yeah. I wish we could show you at home. I wish we could show you here. Well, we can pass this around later. <laughs> but it's that simple to take pictures of your friends in 3D. And they're forever. If you take pictures of your kids in 3D, as I've done for 50 years, it's incredible because you... Those pictures are so much more evocative than, than a snapshot. You, I have pictures of my son when he was first learning to walk in 3D, and I feel like I'm there. I feel like I could, uh, like, like I could talk to him. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so there you go. Yes, we, I'll put this up on the, on the site, and you can see later on. And to <laughs> one of our viewers, Laura, yes, you can see all of these images that Denis showed. Um, they are in the book, and an owl viewer comes with the book, so right. you don't have to purchase one extra. There's an OWL viewer in there, and then you can use your OWL viewer and your phone to make your own 3D images. Always, um, yeah. So a couple of them, uh, I want to get down to some of the questions. We've got a great pile of questions um, coming from the audience. Uh, mm. And uh, James wants to know, now that it's been found, will the Wheatstone stereoscope be on display anywhere? This is maybe not a question for Ooh. you. Well, it was on display. It was on display in a, a, a display case in the, one of the corridors, but of course with COVID and things. Yes. So it was taken out. But maybe we need a something. A big yeah. thumbs up from the back yeah. of the room. So yes, I think it, it will needs, be on yeah, it needs to be seen, and, and that's one of the reasons why we, we 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 insisted on having it back here at King's College because it is important. Yeah, let it be noted. The president is nodding. <laughs> and the president is nodding, so I think that's... <laughs> With the book. <laughs> I think that's a comprehensive yes. Um, a, a question about um, the tissue stereos. Um, they're part of the story of 3D. Could both of you say a little bit more about the tissue stereos, um, just to sort of enliven that story? Shall I start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. They're such beautiful little works of art in themselves and so labor intensive, it's almost impossible to believe that they were mass produced. Basically, they would print a normal stereo image, I say normal, you know, a, a decent stereo image on something, on a very thin piece of paper, almost like tissue paper, but paper that you can see through, translucent, you would say. They would then turn it over, they'd print it on this, uh, this uh, very thin paper, turn it over, paint on the back, uh, all the colours which would make it come to life. Uh, and they would also prick out all things like 
jewellery and lights, so that when you look at this thing from the front, the colours come through and suddenly, instead of looking at a black and white image, you're looking at a full colour image with things that glitter, the jewellery and eyes. In the case of the Diableries, their eyes were made to glow red because they pricked out the eyes and put little coloured red gels on the back. So they're utterly magical. It's, it would be magical enough in mono, but in 3D with the depth as well, they're incredibly beautiful things. And you cannot make them now. We've tried really hard. You know, with all the technology that's available to us now, you cannot make a, a, um, a French tissue of that kind of quality. Even a one-off. Mass production, forget it. Mm. Digital technology just doesn't hack it. So to hold one of these things in your hand and think, oh, here's a nice stereo view. It's, it's black and white. Put it in here. You hold it up to the light and suddenly the whole scene just bursts into life. They are so beautiful. Diableries are a very good example of they them. Are. Yeah. But there's lots of them. There's lots of theatricals. Denise should tell you about theatricals. Tell us about the... Yeah, tissues. well, it's the same principle. And, and the, actually, the tissue part is to, to hide the works because you, there is a very, very thin another layer of paper, just one tissue paper, mm -hmm. so that it diffuses the light and it hides the, it hides the back of the, the card and the fact that it's painted. Mm -hmm. And the only thing is that they are thin paper and thin tissue. They are very fragile. They break easily, especially when they have been you know, pricked and sometimes razor cuts as well. Where, for example, there is a sword or something. Uh, in theatricals, you have people fighting. And so they, they use the razor to, uh, to make the, the sword uh, flash. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it uh, makes the picture very, very fragile. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them are, are damaged, but, but they are amazing. And, and they produced a place uh, scenes from plays in, in tissues and people felt they were there. I mean, we, sometimes, you know, we have DVDs of plays or famous things and we can watch Shakespeare's on DVD. It was the same. They would go to the theater and they would buy a set of six or 12 cards with the main scenes from the play. And it was a way of re relieving the play. Mm. It's amazing. I think mm. we have a good example of a... Uh, uh, the, the Huguenot in the book. Oh, yeah. This is, if you want to have oh, a look, yeah. this is a reproduction as best we can do. This is the way the card, it's a particularly beautiful one called The Fairy by Eliot. This is how it looks when the light's all coming from the front. When the light comes from the back, it turns into this beautiful mm. coloured view. Um, this doesn't do it justice though. We've done our best, but if you actually hold these things and, and view them, they're just magnificent works of art. Uh, it's tissues. Yeah. They're quite incredible. I can recommend to everyone to try and see one mm. for real at some point. The early ones, because after the a while, ones. yes, yeah, after a while, they, they, mm. it was a bit uh, cruder. <laughs> yes, mm. that's the thing, too. There were definitely phases in mm. production, don't you think, um, about the quality and mm. about the level of the photographers who were making these stereos as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about those, the timeline of that? Well, th that's why the book is uh, concentrating on, on the, the first uh, 30 years, well, actually less than that, the, the, the golden age, which lasted only six or seven years, uh, until the, the exhibition of 1862. And after that, it became uh, a little more um, mass production and uh, the le less artistic in a way. And a lot of photographers actually stopped taking photos because they were no longer, they didn't want to, to mass produce too much. They, they wanted quality. And, and after a while, yes, stereo doesn't get as interesting, unfortunately. And, and um, the earlier stereos, they are still mint, most of them. Mm -hmm. And the later ones, they have faded and, uh, and uh, they have badly, well, survived. You know, they, they are, it's quite interesting, really. The, the, earlier, the earlier the photo, usually the better it is. Yeah. yeah. I, I find they're fascinating. And you turned just just the page that I was hoping you would turn to because Did we I? have a question nice. from our audience about taking stereos of the moon. And oh, you yes. said that you were going to tell us how to take a stereo of the moon. So. Oh, no, Denise said I was going to tell you. Yes. Oh, Denise said it, sorry. Well, you, you're the only one who can explain that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, it's, a, it's a fun thing to do. And it, as usual, it was done very, very early. Um, Warren de la Rue, a famous astronomer of the time, had this idea that he wanted to take a stereoscopic picture of the moon. Now, if you just go out there with a stereo camera and take a picture of the moon, you get very little, because your eyes are two and a half inches apart, and the thing is a quarter of a million miles away. So you really want your eyes to be about uh, a tenth of a million miles away, something like that. You can't do that. So what do you do? Well, you let the moon do it for you. You wait, and the moon does this thing called libration. 
the moon is spinning on its axis and it's also going around the Earth, and they're more or less synchronized, which is why always, we always see the same side of the moon, but not quite, because the moon's not going in a circle, it's going in an ellipse. So the spin gets ahead and behind, and viewed from the Earth, it wobbles. So you wait for it to wobble this way and then wobble that way. You put the two pictures together and it's as if your eyes were 100,000 miles apart. So you get your stereo image. And it works like a dream. I've done it recently with my very good friend, uh, astrophotographer Jamie Cooper. And um, there's no limit to the, the fun you can have <laughs> with astronomical objects. The thing about astronomical bodies is they all rotate, so they all can do this. You can take great pictures of Mars by waiting for Mars to rotate, uh, stereoscopic pictures, I should say. And the picture I showed you earlier of the asteroid Bennu, um, that probe was actually more or less standing still, and it's waiting for the... the uh, we, we just waited for the object itself to turn around. There's a problem. The problem is, as it's turning around, the illumination is changing, so the shadows get all messed up and somebody has to sit there for hours and hours and fix the shadows. That's, <laughs> that's generally me. <laughs> that was taken with my very good friend uh, and colleague, Claudio Manzoni, who trawls through all the NASA archives. They're all free, folks. NASA is by public subscription, so you can go on the archives of every NASA mission and find things to make stereos out of. And I know some of you out there are, are already doing this. That applies to the most recent Mars mission, um, uh, which I'm also involved in, very fortunate for me. Uh, so people are going in there and making their own stereos, and it's all good stuff. Mm. And what, what's, what's uh, interesting about Warren DeLarry is that he was using wet collagen again, so not very sensitive. And, and sometimes he had to wait four years to get the two pairs. Because this is Britain, so you know, <laughs> we, even if you, you, you're there ready, oh, yeah. oh yes, there, there are clouds in the sky. Oh, so you have to wait. Yeah, you have to match up the phases exactly. So if you want a, a stereo picture of a half moon, you have to wait for that exact moment when the illumination is right. And normally there's a cloud in the way, so you wait till the next month and the next month. And as you say, Warren Delarue Warren waited four or five years for the whole project. James asked a question about um, whether Wheatstone and Brewster profited from the stereoscope, but I think it's interesting to note that uh, the sort of role of publishers, especially when you think about the stereos of the moon, which were wildly popular, Delarue patented his and mm. had them sold through a publisher. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about the role of the publisher and about how people mm. actually made money um, <laughs> in this way. <laughs> it's fascinating for me having recreated the London Stereoscopic Company, I see myself encountering all the problems that they must have encountered. It's really interesting. Um, problems of actually how you make the things, how you reproduce them, how you sell them, how you advertise them, um, how you handle your staff, you know, how you handle the credits to your staff. The, the, the original LSA were notoriously ungenerous. They never credited their photographers. So I think that's rather immoral. I always try and credit people. All those things. Um, but as for making money, very difficult. <laughs> um, we, we kind of break even, I guess, on what we do at the moment, which is great. I'm quite happy with that because it's all about getting the stuff out there. There's no doubt that the London Stereoscopic Company in the late 1850s did make a profit, mm -hmm. but I think it, it disappeared quite quickly when the popularity mm -hmm. declined and they had to diversify into different things. They started selling musical instruments and... Yeah. Um, bicycles. Also, yes, really? bicycles and everything. And they were still around until 1920 something or other, yeah. but eventually the company was wound up. So they eventually obviously decided it wasn't profitable, but boy, they had a good run. It's mm -hmm. not bad from 1850 to 1920, whatever. And when you wanted to publish a book in the 1850s, 60s with stereos, you couldn't print the stereos. You had to actually, well, uh, you could print photographs, real photographs. So they had to paste real photographs in the books. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, you know, it's, do it's done with machines. But in those days, somebody had to actually print, contact print all the images and paste them by hand in the book. Mm -hmm. And that must have cost a lot. Mm -hmm. But they, they, would, they did wonderful things. Yeah. Which is probably why they began selling them as a sort of appended Thing, you'd get your text and then you would get your stereos exactly, yeah. as a separate object and yes. the text and the stereos would go together. Yeah, we can do it all in one book. We have a wonderful designer, Jamie Simmons, who's here tonight, 
who puts all these things together. And a wonderful publisher who is uh, Robin Rees, a very small team, and he interacts with the present day printers and publishers to get the maximum quality. Because in an art book, you can do quite well. Things look very photographic. If you're viewing it with the stereoscope, you, you have a, a quite a significant magnification. So normally, even with a good art book, you'll see all the dots of the reproduction. We have a very fine screen, which is called stochastic, so there's a randomization of the dots. Mm. So this stands up pretty well in the stereoscope. It's about as well as you can do now. So I, I hate it when you see a stereoscopic book, which someone spent a lot of time putting together, but you put your stereoscope on it, and suddenly all you can see is dots. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff which we, as publishers, we get into. We want the quality. We want people to enjoy them and go, wow. And it's the wow which makes us happy. <laughs> And it really allows people to study them. As, and, and I think I'm this sorry. is in, in this way, this is what I meant when I said this has contributed so much to us taking these objects seriously, is finally we can get a book um, mm. and, and people around the world can t use these to see what the stereo really looks like. Yeah. Obviously, you can't reproduce a daguerreotype in the same way. Yeah. Obviously, it looks a little bit different if it's this sort of ink versus mm. hand tinting. But at the same time, it makes it possible. Um, to contemplate what these yeah. objects might look like were you to have them, were you to be able to be here and see the fantastic stereos yeah. that are here. Absolutely. Yeah. We're engaged in all kinds of stuff in the LSC now because we've published a book about um, the moon landings mm -hmm. on the 50th anniversary, and of course they, they were all real stereos. We were able to go back into their archives mm -hmm. and make stereos anew. And um, astronomy is, is a very good subject for stereo, and we're planning at this moment, the very first stereoscopic atlas of an asteroid called Bennu, the one I showed you earlier. And it will have lots and lots of stereoscopic views in and a whole history of asteroids and this particular voyage of discovery. So I'm very excited about that, that the sky is the limit. There is really no limit for what you can do with stereoscopy. And is this something that you think um, both Wheatstone, that Wheatstone thought about or talked about when he was first thinking about no, this is how stereo vision works? We think not. No, no. Br Brewster honestly tried Brewster. all the applications. Which Stone was always insisting on the, the experiments about binocular vision. That's that's what he he, um, he had in mind. He, he tried. I mean, he asked people to take photos. I mean, there is this amazing collection here at King's College of 96 stereoscopic pairs for the, uh, the Whitstone stereoscope, but they are very difficult to view because you can't free view them. They are too big. So. Uh, the, the best thing would be to photograph them and reduce them and so that they could. So we, we, we have printed a couple here. Uh, but uh, so he, he wanted people to make photos for his stereoscope, but he never really got into the applications and what they could do. Yeah. That's right. So yeah, he was an academic, I think. Yeah. He was more a yeah, researcher and uh, experimenter. I mean, he was professor of experimental philosophy for 40 years here. So that's a, quite a long career. It really is. Yeah. And it's been quite a long evening, and I'm afraid it's now time for us to wrap up. So I want to first thank the two of you, Dr. Brian May, Denis Pellerin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank King's for this fantastic venue and uh, all of their hospitality and the British Library for supporting the launch of this fabulous book. Um, once again, the book is uh, for sale. It will be on your screen. There's a button to press somewhere on your screen. Um, and you too can have this in your living room and enjoy it as long and make your own stereos to go in your owl viewer that you will get along with the book. And can I say thank you, Kelly? Kelly Wilder, so for much. presenting this and putting so much work into this. Thank you. Thank you.